You're listening to Thunder Quack Podcast Network. Welcome back to Thunder Quack Perfect 10. I am your host, Michael Cohen, and I, oh man, I'm excited about this one. I, I say that every episode, but the reality is that like, I'm excited every episode. This is, this is the thing about this podcast. I just grab people that I like and I ask them to talk about things that we both like, and it's just it's fun. Like this is the most fun that a person can possibly have podcasting. And I, I, this episode in particular, I think fits that bill because of the topic. And, uh, and that, that topic, as you've no doubt, I, uh, I uh, figured out by now, cause you've read the title of the episode in your podcast app, I uh, is, is going to be Indiana Jones. I mean, specifically Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I, uh, I, uh, is, there isn't a movie that better defines what a perfect 10 is than a movie like Raiders of the Lost Ark. So like, this is, this is about the most fun that we can have on the podcast. This is, this is what it was designed for. And, uh, and as always, in order to have a conversation about a perfect 10, I got to bring on the person in my sphere that I think of as like the expert, the, the most passionate person on that topic uh and i uh, and and for this one for indiana jones in general and raiders of the lost ark specifically that's my guest on this episode cheryl bell cheryl thank you so much for being on the podcast wow what an introduction <laughs> thank you so much for having me i hope i live up to the to your high expectations <laughs> oh listen you and i met at star wars celebration last year Yes. We, I, uh, I, uh, mutual friends of Marie Claire Gould, host of What the Force. Go listen to What the Force. There's a there's a new episode coming out. I've already listened to it because I'm a Patreon supporter over there, and it is phenomenal. Uh, her and Missy, who have both been on the podcast, they've both been on Perfect Ten. Um, the new episode of the What the Force coming out soon. By the time that this drops, it's probably already out. Actually, I guess it is already out because this doesn't come out until Monday. I uh, but uh, yeah, so go listen to that. Go go grab that right now. Go listen to that episode. Um, uh, Marie Claire, uh, MC as we often refer to her, right? Um, such an awesome, amazing person, my and f- uh, my fairy godmother, as I like to refer to <laughs> yeah. her. Yes. Um, and naturally, we're both friends with her. Uh, so obviously we're just it was just like oh so we're so you and i are friends now that's it yeah. that's how, like that's how that works right just the transitive property if 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 you, if mc says you're cool you're cool like that's as far as i'm concerned yeah. everybody she introduced me to over the course of that that weekend um everybody that we hung out with it was like all I mean, these people are awesome like yeah. every, everybody is so cool yeah. but you you and i spent a lot of time together over the course of that weekend with with Marie Claire and uh, in particular, we went to Disneyland together. We did, right? we did, and, and we rode the the uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of the the what? It's the Temple of the Forgotten Eye. What Temple Forbidden of the Eye? Forbidden, Forbidden Eye. Eye. For, yeah, Forgotten Eye. Forbidden I mean, Eye. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we so. And like, and like you, and we sat next to each other. Like, well, like, because your, your lovely wife, Crystal, who yeah. I had, I mean, I, I barely knew you technically. Yeah. I mean, I'd only yeah. really known you for about a day and that was, yeah. just, that wasn't like a full day. That was just like here and there and hanging out or mm-hmm. whatever. And then we were at Star Wars night. Um, and again, hanging out with a group of people like, and uh, through the course of the evening, we're like, okay, we got to do indie. We got to do indie. And then yeah. realizing that you were 
just as big of an indie fan as I was. And so mm-hmm. we were in the talking about how much we love the queue when we were in the queue and like reminiscing. And then uh, I think it was when we got closer to the front of the line, I kind of, I, uh, your wife who I just met that night, uh, bless her. I was just like, is it okay if I sit next to your husband on the ride? <laughs> and she was like, yeah, go for it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, thanks. <laughs> Uh, Chris, yeah, Crystal is exhausted by me. Like, like we've been together for uh, uh, eighteen years, right? So, and like she's ridden indie with me. Uh, I don't know. We've lost count because I uh, I ride it at least once every day that I'm in Disneyland, right? right. Like as long as long as it's up and running. Of <laughs> infamously, yeah. infamously, it, it it loves to break down, but I. Uh, yeah, so I like we've lost track of how many times we've been on that ride because it is at Disneyland. It is my favorite ride. Yeah, um, even and, and, even and, with the addition of Rise of the Resistance and Smuggler's Run, still India is the best. Uh, and it just got a revamp. I can't wait to go back. Oh my god, the snake is working again. The snake was broken yeah. when we were there. Yeah, I, I, but I, yeah, um, and I like to sit in the driver's seat. You do because I like. I like to pretend like I'm actually driving the car. The steering wheel doesn't move for anybody who's never been on the ride. The <laughs> steering wheel is like this rubber disc that's in front of you. It doesn't even really look like a steering wheel. But, but you I like never to... know it when you're sitting at yeah. the helm of it. Because you yeah. you make it seem like you are actually driving <laughs> that vehicle yeah. and taking us around those corners. And we were just having the grandest time <laughs> together on that ride. Yeah. So it's an experience like that that, that tells me that you are the perfect person to talk about, uh, about, uh, uh, Henry Jones Jr. You know, like, like I, I can't, I can't imagine having this conversation with anybody else. So I, yeah, that's, you're the, you're, you are, you are an indie expert. You, 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 you bleed, uh, uh, brown leather, right? Like that's, that's (laughs) brown leather and whips and, you know, yeah, exactly. Um, (laughs) Awesome. So that now that that's all out of the way, right? So now now people know why you're here and 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 wh- how you've been vetted uh, for this for this prestigious honor, right? Um, <laughs> to be on to be on Perfect Ten, which again, if I'll just remind everybody, it's just me talking to my friends about stuff that we like. I I the best concept for a podcast ever. I let's get into it. Let's get into. We're specifically going to talk about Raiders of the Lost Ark, but um for those listeners i don't know who you are if you've been listening to me podcasts on the internet for any length of time and you have not seen an indiana jones film i don't i don't know what i've done wrong um but uh let's just pretend like there's somebody listening to this podcast that for some reason is not familiar with uh with 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 uh the 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 most famous archaeologist in history um who really doesn't do a heck of a lot of archaeology yeah um <laughs> please please explain to the audience what is an indiana jones what is an indiana jones well a lot of people might actually not have indiana jones in their vernacular because it did come out in 1981 So I bet you there's a lot of young Gen Zers out there who haven't yet discovered Indy. But uh, the premise basically is um, there was this wonderful creative man named George Lucas. Mm. And yes, this is a very Star Wars adjacent film. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of the creators that went into making this film were involved in creating Star Wars. So he Mm. grew up watching... uh, adventure serials that would come on when he was a kid on the TV. Um, And they were little action adventure serials about uh, the hero that would go on some action adventure and then it would be like, oh, find out what happens to our favorite hero. Tune in next week. And then it would resolve the following week and he'd get himself into another adventure. Um, So it was those serials that George, I mean, he, Star Wars was influenced by Flash Gordon. 
Indiana Jones very much influenced by, I forget the name of the serials, the specific one that he loved. So chime in with it if you happen to know the name of it. I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, and he wanted it to have, he was thinking, I want my version of James Bond. No, he didn't quite go full James Bond, which I'm thankful for. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, just wanted the the action adventure hero, his version of James Bond, but based more on the, the serial adventures set in the 1940s. He's going to be battling Nazis. That was his his basic outline when he started. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he uh, he sat down with uh, Philip Kaufman, and they together kind of hashed out, fleshed out more the script the idea that we have today, Philip came up with the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant as the MacGuffin. Um, Philip Kaufman came up with uh, quite a few good ideas, and I'm very grateful that he was involved in the very early stages of this project. Uh, and then later it was uh, George Lucas, his buddy, Steven Spielberg, and the amazing Lawrence Kasten, who is a very wonderful screenwriter who spent three days together coming up with the, uh, the script. And it was born out of that. Uh, it was actually, so he actually thought of Indiana Jones. Sorry, I'm like going off on a tangent. He thought of Indiana Jones, I want to say before or at the very same time as Star Wars. Like he had mm -hmm. these two ideas in his head, like going consecutively. Star Wars ended up becoming, okay, this is the one that's I'm going for right now. And that became his focus and priority. So he was uh, vacationing in Hawaii when Star Wars, uh, it was its opening weekend. He wanted to get away from whether or not it was going to bomb or be a success. So he was vacationing <laughs> in Hawaii and he was building sand castles on a beach in Hawaii with Steven Spielberg. Like these men are too pure. Yeah. And uh, the reviews were coming in. Star Wars was this huge success. And so uh, George was able to breathe a sigh of relief and was like, so Steven, what, what do you, what do you want to do next? Steven was, had just finished Jaws which was also a resounding success. And Stephen's like, I really want to do a James Bond film. And so George was like, I've got something better than that. And he told him the story of what was then called Indiana Smith. And mm -hmm. uh, Stephen was just like, I got to do it. So that's, that's where it was born. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love, I've heard that story a million times. Like, like mm -hmm. one of those things of like, I, I can't even tell you how many times. Uh, I've, I've heard that in interviews and read it and whatever. Um, and every time it is just always so charming because like, here's these two guys like that are about to become uh, the like really like the, 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 the fathers of modern cinema. Yes. Yeah. And they don't, they don't realize it at that point in time. Yeah, just They're just baby infancy, just starting, yeah. just getting that first taste of success. And it's just like, yeah. Oh yeah. Like they're just, and they're just, they're just a couple of friends uh, who've had a little bit of success uh, and are, are, are just trying to figure out what they're going to do next. And so you end up with, um, I mean, like, cause at this point in time, they're like, like George Lucas is not yet George Lucas, right? Like it's, we are just, just at the beginning of that. And Jaws has just happened. Uh, and, and so like these two guys are at the beginning of the careers that, that we come to know them for. Yeah. And, and like the idea that to like, just like monolithic creatives would come together mm -hmm. in that way today. It's just like, I don't even know. I don't even know if that's even possible. Cause I don't know. I don't know who you would even compare. Right. Like, like there are certainly incredible uh, filmmakers nowadays, but, um, but not in the same way. Like the, I think the, 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 the amazing thing about both George and Steven and I think the reason why they work well together and why Indiana Jones becomes the special thing that it is, is that the two of them are just really, really keyed in on telling 
like universal stories that anybody can enjoy. Mm -hmm. Like, like there's just, there's, there's an aspect to it where it's like in any other, in any other creatives hands, a lot of the stuff that they've done would just sort of be considered like, Oh, like this is just, you know, sort of, I don't like populist like drivel, right? Like it's like, oh, these are B movies, right? Star Wars is a B movie if not for George Lucas, if not for his vision, if not for him going and getting Ralph McQuarrie and uh, and John Williams and bringing together the the talent that he does in order to make. I mean, like like the creation of ILM is such a perfect example of mm-hmm. that, where it's like, no, the, like no one exists that can do the things that I need done. I will make it myself. Yeah. Um, they surround then, themselves with like dream teams yeah, and like creatives, yeah. people that just love to make movies, people that just Absolutely. love going to the movies and like, yeah, and surround themselves with great screenwriters, great directors, great producers. We've got like, there's yeah. there's some seriously big names on here, like Frank Marshall producing. Yep. Um, this is when a baby Kathleen Kennedy was brought in. <laughs> as yep. associate assistant to Mr. Steven Spielberg and yep. he recognized her her talent pretty quickly on I'm sure. Um yeah. oh yeah by the end of by the end of the production uh, she was basically yeah. a producer, right? Exactly. The next, the next yeah. film he makes is like, oh you're a producer. Yeah. Like you like we'll, you're we'll give you a proper credit next, next time. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So ben Burt for sound design. Yep. I mean, yep. come on. I mean, this this film is a cornucopia of amazing yep. sounds. Um, yeah, it, it's John Williams. I mean, yep. would this film even be... I mean, it's already going to be like a 9 out of 10. But like, John Williams makes this the 10 out of 10. Like, it, you can't... It, would it have been as good without his iconic themes and motifs? Like, mm-hmm. dare I say, no, it wouldn't. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, yeah, I, it's 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 one of those things. I I we live in a world, and and the age that we are, right? Like, there's no there's no escaping Indiana Jones. Like, he's 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 been Indiana Jones for as long as as I've been alive, right? Yeah. Like it's it's just a foregone conclusion. Like like that's like that character that music the the iconography of it it's all just like there it is right there's yeah. no um there's no escaping it um which anytime that i encounter somebody who's not super familiar with indiana jones i'm just like so like what do you like how do you what do you even do for fun right and they'll say something <laughs> like you like to go outside and go for hikes and stuff i'm just like okay fine whatever Clearly but I mean, friends. I'm right. sure, but, but the lasting impact on popular culture from this mm-hmm. film, this was the first like real action adventure film. This did not exist mm-hmm. before. Like we don't yeah. have the big action movies of the eighties without Raiders of the Lost Ark. This yeah. showed the world that there is an appetite for this kind of film. And we'll get into it later, I'm sure, why this one stands the test of time over the mm-hmm. other ones. Um, the key being the 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 very character of Indy and what makes him so, such a lasting um a lasting character that uh just carries so well over, throughout all of time. But like yeah, you don't get the uh, so many of the movies that they watch Mm-hmm. are directly influenced by this film um yeah. yeah yeah well i mean like 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 even even like more modern stuff i mean like the opening of guardians of the galaxy is like there is a, there's direct mm-hmm. homage yeah. at the beginning of that movie to the beginning of this movie which like raiders we're kind of talking about indie in general um but but raiders specifically uh, has the the greatest cold open, oh my, of all time, right? I mean, like, like, yes, like, no, uh, d- from, like the best, yeah. yeah, yeah, like, uh, I like, I have, yeah, I'm like the reveal of the character is brilliant, mm. 
Like we don't, we like, and we don't see him right away. Our point of view for the first bit of the film is uh, Satipo's point of view. And then we have that, like the silhouette of the man in the hat walk out of the shadows into a beam of sunlight. And like the music's still kind of omni, um, like ominous. Like we're yeah. like, is this our hero? Like, I'm not so sure. And, and we see this guy who makes mistakes. Like, he doesn't always get it right. He doesn't always make the, the landing. <laughs> he, uh, he misjudges things. Like, he, he's, he, he doesn't make it look... It's not easy for him, which is what mm-hmm. makes Indy special, is, like, we see him struggle, but we see him, yeah. uh, obviously, he, he gets his prize. But then the prize is taken away from him, which, again, we're like, oh, okay. But, like, I just love that we don't know right away. We're like, is this a guy that we're rooting for? Or not Mm -hmm. like who is this guy but yeah and to start off with such a huge we're already in the thick of this adventure like we're coming into this this is a a chapter of a book that's already started we're jumping right in and uh and it just it's such a great hook like after that opening sequence you were like i am ready for this ride like this is gonna be good I th- and I think this is this is the piece of of George Lucas's brilliant mind that I think is so often overlooked is the is the way that he he understands how to architect a story to get you immediately enamored with what's happening on screen mm-hmm. um, and and like it is like his, his use of the cold open defines what the, like that's become and and now like I think we're so. We're so used to cold opens. Most TV shows have cold opens now, right? Like, like that, like that is just, it's such a, uh, every episode of Smallville. I was just watching Smallville the other night. <laughs> just randomly is just something to put on. And it's like every episode of Smallville opens with, with a cold open. Right. And then, and then goes into the theme song and yeah, whatnot. And that is the reason why we have that is because George Lucas was like, here's here's star wars i uh, what's the first scene in the movie i i don't know a spaceship blasting in another spaceship who which one's the good guy and which one's the bad guy what's going on is i mean there's obvious clues as to who is the good guy and who's the bad guy right but yeah very but, obvious visual cues yeah yeah, yeah and yeah, the musical but, cues yeah yeah but it just like it just throws us right into the middle of the action mm-hmm. um uh, I in media res is the technical term for it, right? Like we're, we are in the middle of the story. Um, and that is the inspiration from those serials that, they that he was inspired by, right? Like that, right. like that, that thing of like, well, if you missed last week, then, you know, uh, what's going on, <laughs> mm-hmm. and you'll, but you'll figure it out, you'll yeah. figure it out. And then you'll, and then you'll keep going from there. Right. So, so yeah, this, this story of, Indy uh, uh, going after this this fertility idol it, like we don't know how he got there I mean like like we get to the end of this cold open and he gets in the plane and I uh, and and here's the like the, his buddy jock right yeah. and it's like okay <laughs> um the uh, the best part about that i always love this is that it's like they're flying away and the snake is in the plane and he's i hate snake jock i hate him uh and it's like where was the snake on the way there like did you did he so this not, is my theory he didn't this is there? my theory is <laughs> no. that he didn't fly in on the plane he had the mm. plane arranged to be there because he's like i think i'm gonna find this by this day like obviously it's it's yeah, yeah, 19, yeah. what 38 36 30 i forget what year is it 36 or 38 that Indy takes place in? Oh, this one. Yeah. I don't know. I, I always have a hard time with this because it's because it's um because they're out of order, right? Right. <laughs> Temple yeah. of Doom is a prequel. Well, let's <laughs> just say George. 36. Yeah. But he comes in because we see the donkeys with them as he's coming in with the with yeah, yeah. people and the other guide. Um, so I think he's trekked in by foot. He knows he's like, okay, I have an idea, a general idea of where this is going to be. I don't know exactly where the temple is. I've got now I've finally collected all these fragment map pieces. I think he's just told Jock, I should be here around X day. Keep yeah, an eye yeah. out for me. And that's why. So I don't think he came in with Jock. I think he left with Jock and he didn't realize this yeah. guy's got <laughs> his pets, which is an amazing setup. 
because it's just oh, it's it's so a funny good. line and it's just it makes us laugh and then yeah. the way it comes in like the worst setups are the ones where you're like oh that's that's gonna come into play later right and and yeah. The Raiders has all these wonderful setups, especially in the exposition scene, which is one of my favorite scenes um, coming up that I'm sure we'll touch on. But um, yeah, it's just these wonderful little, you know, I hate Snake's truck. I hate him. And then we get such a wonderful payoff later on in the movie. And it makes us laugh because that's the, the thing about Raiders is it's so much fun because we yeah. get to laugh a lot. Yeah, and that and that to me, like that's where that's where George and Steven come together, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm, because like mm-hmm. like Star, Star Wars has a lot of humor in it, it's, and it's very funny. Spielberg's I would say that like a funny guy too. Yeah, yeah, like Empire and Return of the Jedi definitely like like add to that. Um, um, well, we've got Lawrence Kasdan in. Yeah, Lawrence well, Kasdan exactly. wrote this, and he wrote yeah. Empire. So, yeah. got to give credit to Larry when it's. That's true. Right? That's true. He's, he's a great um, screenwriter. So yeah, and that like the, all of that humor. It's like we've just been through this like very harrowing ordeal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and we laugh uh, through the ordeal too. Like when he tries yeah. to jump over that chasm and does not make that jump, yeah. and grabs onto that root, and he's like, ah. Oh. And then the root slips, and he's got this look of like absolute panic and fear on his face. It's like we yeah. don't usually get that. Yeah. With the heroes and so just yeah. seeing those moments of he doesn't have his uh, lack of a better word I, I was gonna swear there i don't know if i can swear on your podcast <laughs> but uh he doesn't always have his uh everything together yeah so <laughs> yeah. uh yeah it's just those fun moments that make us laugh um uh, to to relieve that tension through those yeah through those scenes yeah well, and that's Harrison Ford, and this this is the funny thing is that like by the by the late '90s, Harrison Ford ends up with this this um, sort of this reputation for for you know his characters being like grumpy and serious and gruff, and it's I always find that really funny, and then and then that translates into his personal reputation as well, and there's this attitude of like, oh, Harrison Ford's no fun, he's 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 this serious grumpy guy, and I'm always like I'm always like you don't you haven't been paying enough attention to this guy like he has one yeah. of the best senses of humor he's got of a any very, actor he's got a there. wry dry yeah. sense of humor and and you see it in a lot there's a lot of behind the scenes footage and you see him being a lot more his goofy self right mm-hmm. but yet yeah, no he's still he's got amazing comedic timing but he's yeah. just never over the top I and I th- I think the reason why he works so well as characters like Han and Andy is that Harrison is a is a big kid, and he like he he has this persona that he does in media because he in media junkets because he doesn't like doing press. Right. I, who could blame him? It's it's a yeah. it's a thankless, uh, yeah. a, obnoxious part of the process, right? He wants to. He's there. He's there for, for the, the craft. Acting, he's right? there for yeah. the acting. Yes. Yeah. But he is absolutely just this big grown up goof like yeah. like a hundred percent and it comes through i think with indy more than any other character that he's ever played and i think it's why he loves the character so much i th- i think that indy is probably one of the closest to him uh that that you can see if 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 people haven't seen the series shrinking which is uh it, oh it god it's so good recent things he is so so good in it i think that is just him like that's just I don't think he's doing a lot of acting, not to say that his performance isn't great, but like I don't think that there's a lot of like him being engrossed in a different character <laughs> as much as he's just like putting himself in a scenario and letting us enjoy it. I think there's a lot of him in that in that character. Um and he's so much fun in that show. But even like like the last time that he played Indy, obviously we've got a new one coming out at the end of this month mm-hmm. um, and we'll see, we'll see what that one's all about and how that goes. But kingdom of the crystal skull, much as it's maligned, I don't necessarily understand it. I think that it's a fine film. Uh, it's certainly not as good as the other three indie movies, but right. like what is, you know, like yeah. it's unfair. <laughs> um, but there are some moments in that movie uh, with him playing an older indie that are just yeah. like, I, it, when we talk about the, the, the setup with the snake and when, when uh, when Mutt tosses him the snake to pull him out of the quicksand, <laughs> and he's like, he won't. T- and he's like, just say it's a rope. Just say it's a. Just say grab the rope. 
his face is so screen. good because he's yeah. he he allows himself to be vulnerable. He allows he he allows his characters to be fallible, which like yes. you compare that to Vin Diesel or The Rock. Who, yeah, no. I mean, like The Rock, I think is is a little bit closer to to Harrison in this way, that, where like like Dwayne Johnson will play characters that don't take themselves too seriously. Yeah. Vin Diesel will not. Like it's in his contract. I can't lose a fist fight. Yeah. Right. Like like when I'm making these movies, I have to win every fight. And, and it's like fragile masculinity. Yeah, I love the Fast franchise. I love it so much. And I I actually like I quite enjoy the hilarity that is the infallible dom toretto like he's just he's he's just indestructible invincible the strongest person in any room for some reason because it's like because you look at vin diesel and you're like not really like like i don't believe i don't believe you as any of this but the world this world believes you as this and that's part of the fun is like like i it's funny because i don't think that vin is in on the joke that the rest of us are like eh, we're kind of laughing at you not really with you um and then yeah. he's surrounded by all these other great characters the fast yeah. is a is a that's a perfect 10 for another time but i i but yeah like i just i i look at a character like that and performances like that and i compare it to to harrison and we get this scene later on in the movie where they're on the the boat um and like they, they've got the arc and mary in it and we finally get some respite right like we get to we we get to to slow down after all of right. these action sequences and marion's sort of you know trying to take care of uh indy and and he's like ow 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 where doesn't it hurt and he and he starts going here 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 pointing it at, at uh, his elbow and his forehead and whatever and he like he he he's been so tough and so um, I not necessarily together cause he is making it up as he goes, but yeah, but yeah. like, just like confident was like, it's like, I don't know. I'm going to figure it out. It's fine. Don't worry about it. I, and, but then just the two of them in this moment, he just, he drops all of that pretense and he becomes so vulnerable and he's just, he's like a child where he's just like, he's just like, it's all knows you right here on the yeah. forehead i guess <laughs> i mean he's a lot he's been he's just been through hell and back he hasn't yeah no slept and like i exactly. think more than 24 <clears throat> hours at that point but yeah no like in like you said indy is a fallible hero like yeah. yes he has yeah. he has all the heroic qualities he's intelligent he's brave mm -hmm. he packs a mean punch but his motivations mostly in this film uh are selfish ambition he he's very mm -hmm. much in his fortune and glory phase and there's a yeah. duality to him like harrison has said indy is both a romantic and a cynic he's mm -hmm. he's a realist he's not your typical hero that's usually very idealistic with a strong moral compass like and he, he like he's always in over his head he shows fear he shows pain he shows fatigue like no other actor takes a beating like Harrison Ford. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like and and, and Indy he, like Indy fights like a just regular fighting. Like there's nothing like yeah. super fancy about him. His only yeah. party trick is a bull whip and like a mean right hook. But and that, but that's why we love Indy. We see ourselves in him and he is relatable. Like a, as much as someone who's just beating Nazis left and right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh till the cows come home. He is he's He's one of those those characters that uh, the reason why the audience gravitates toward like to him so easily is because they they can picture themselves being him. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's he's, he's got that that perfect everyman quality, right? I mean, it's the same reason we love uh, Peter Parker and Spider Man stories so much, right? Like like these characters. I that, mean, I don't like, know. He's kind of a genius. I'm not really that smart, but. <laughs> 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 but uh, i i yes it, yes like like this this aspect of like not it, everything doesn't always go right you know even though even though he's he he's gonna come in and he's gonna figure it out before anybody else i mean one, one of my favorite um moments in raiders is is when they're they're with the old man and they're going over like the medallion it's being translated <clears throat> and and he has the realization of like like I, it's it's one of my favorite moments in the entire franchise when him and Sala are like they're they're putting it together and he's like 
their staff is the staff is too too long and they both yeah. say at the same time they're digging, digging in the wrong, in the wrong place. place yeah it's it's such a great because like w- the way it's written and the way that it's it's um that it's blocked and performed we're figuring this out at the same time that India is figuring this out, right? Like, like right. they've like we're being given this information, and it's like, oh, but wait, flip it over, but take back one for the the Hebrew God, right? And it's like, yeah, like, and we're going like, wait a second, wait a second, take back one. They don't know that they've only got the burn on his hand, right? Um, Which and, we don't uh, even know it's a burn. We, we don't even we don't, know how they yeah. have it, and that's that's yeah. that great tell yeah. in that exposition scene, the setup. Right. When he's yeah. like, oh, no one really knows how tall it is. You know, the staff yeah. is so high. No one really knows its actual height. That tiny yeah. little setup. And then we get to this scene and they're like, this is important. And then, of course, further when he uh, raises yeah. his hand and then we see that was that that was the other setup of him burning his hand in the thing. And then we're like, ah, yeah. that's OK. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's just it's uh it it's it it rewards you for paying attention. Yeah. But it also like it puts you in his shoes of like, oh, we're figuring out the mystery. Is I say this a lot, right? Like like twists that come out of nowhere in movies that like cause this has been a thing in recent years, right? Mystery box nonsense, whatever. Yeah. The JJ yeah, well, Abrams way of telling a story. Yeah. Where it's like you're trying to trick the audience, right? And that's like like it's like uh, M. Night Shyamalan, J.J. Abrams, and Christopher Nolan, they have this attitude of like, it's almost like adversarial. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Where it's like... like no, you, you want to feed your audience just the crumbs. A good... Because a they want to come along yeah. and help figure it out. They're like, oh, like... Exactly. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing more satisfying than figuring out the twist five seconds before it's revealed to the audience. Right? And a, and a good movie does that for you raiders does it like five times <laughs> where it's like we're gonna do this but that, uh, 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 we got you and it's like um it's it's like it's like marion presumably dying and then it's like and we're right. as the audience going no way no way she's got to be alive so then when she's revealed to be alive we're just as relieved as indy right because we're like we're like see i told you there's no way that they were in that they could kill her in the right. middle of the movie there's no resolution to that right like we even if we don't have words for it we still we know we know deep inside it's like they're not they can't just kill we didn't even see her die right she didn't get a death scene she's just in a basket and explodes that's yeah. ridiculous right yeah <laughs> um but but this is also the end of a sequence where at the beginning of it we have this moment that subverts our expectations because the swordsman comes out and he flips the sword around I was literally I to prepare for the podcast. I was watching Indy with the girls, and Kara is sitting next to me. And the the swordsman comes out. She's seen the movie before. She we've watched Raiders at least twice. Um, he comes out and he's flipping the sword around, and she kind of like tenses up. She's like, "Oh my goodness, like where it's going to be a big fight." And then Indy pulls out the gun and just <laughs> gives the guy one, and the, and and the the action sequence just never happens. I uh, and I uh, I you know like it's, it's so we've we have that that's like wait a second what's going on right yeah and so, that's a test they did they choreographed a whole fight scene for that yeah they did they were going to go that route that was what George wanted to do and so of course we've all heard about the the crew. Uh, was very heavily sick with dysentery when yeah. shooting out in the Sahara. Uh, Harrison was very tired and very sick. And the Harrison keeps on asking this question. He's like, well, why don't I just shoot these guys? Right? Yeah. Uh, like he, he, like early, even earlier in the market, he's like, what, what is preventing me from yeah. just taking out my gun and shooting these guys? And the stunt coordinator, um, he was like, well, it's because they're on you like so fast you don't have time so that's why we're doing this you know fighting with our fists and dodging yeah. swords and all this kind of stuff so then after it's like okay if now harrison's finally like well i got time to pull out my gun now yeah you yeah. know and why don't i just shoot the guy and <laughs> and uh and then uh the stunt guy just went along with it harrison just yeah. decided i'm gonna do the take this way i don't think they ever really spoke about it ahead of time the stunt guy yeah. went along with it and then steven really wanted he's like that's the shot that's what i'm putting yeah. in the film and george was like no i want it the other way and so they're like okay let's let's take it to a test audience 
And they literally, they took it to the audience. They showed Steven's version first with the, just the shooting. The audience laughed so hard. They got yeah. the biggest laugh of the whole film. And George was like, "We don't need to show them my version. You, you can keep your version." <laughs> that, that's the great thing about it, these two these two guys yeah. that have the potential to have very big egos, and they just he recognized, you know what, you're right. Let's do it your way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the best part of that scene is uh, like the next time anybody's watching Raiders, I, I is is he he shoots him, and then he immediately turns around. Like he just turns away from the guy. And it's, we're kind of watching, we're not really focused on Indy in that, in that shot. We're watching this guy fall backwards and everybody in the background kind of react to like, oh my God, he just did that. Um, but if you watch Harrison, his performance in that moment is like, he's just so disaffected by it. He's so like he's tired. Like, there's, he's, he's exhausted hot. and he's just he's like, he's like, I, gotta, the, I don't want to fight on. anymore of these guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I it's just so, have a date to just go stroll through a market without trying to like dodge yeah. being killed? Like <laughs> it's it's so so good. He he just it's it. Those are the moments that just make us love the character so much because we're just mm -hmm. like yeah. That's although it is a little bit. I mean, like like let's be real. Indy's a little bit of a of a sociopath. <laughs> I mean, just, this just, guy, this guy is, he's selfish and his, his yeah. moral compass is ambiguous. I mean, yeah. like, and this is something that took me forever to figure out because growing up, I mean, this has just always been in, um, in my household. So growing up, you just always see him when you're watching as a kid, you're just like, that's the hero. But as, as I've gotten older and I'm looking at it through an older eyes, his motivation for going after the Ark is not one of true altruism. Because remember, he doesn't believe in the mythical power of the Ark. He just thinks it's important historical significance, like an artifact. He's not going after it because he thinks it will make the Nazis invincible. He's going after it because it's like this famous renowned object and will probably bring him notoriety and some fame and maybe some credibility and legitimacy because a lot of people accuse him of being a looter, which spoiler alert, he is. <laughs> um, yeah. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, like his whole motivation, this time, this whole film, he doesn't believe in the power of the arc and he doesn't, mm. he's not doing it just because he thinks, Oh my God, evil is going to spread over the face of the earth. And he chooses the arc. And then when you look at it in this, in this context, I'm just like, he chooses the Ark over Marion twice. Mm -hmm. Like the hero always saves the girl. Well, Indy's going to save the girl eventually, but first he's going to leave you with some Nazis for a bit. Yeah. And, and like, this is like, when you take into context his motivation for it, you're like, oh my gosh, he chooses the Ark over her before he realizes its power. And he's so he's still just going after his prize. And so, I mean, Indy's true full character arc isn't isn't uh isn't really finished until crusades when he finally realizes the person's more valuable than the object but i i just had never really growing up i had never really taken that into context and i was like wow this guy yeah he's our hero but he's kind of a selfish <laughs> he's, he's, <laughs> yeah he, he's not doing it for the greater good like a lot of the time he's just doing he's looking out for number one <laughs> like yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like, like Temple of Doom, like doubles down on it. Right. Um, right. Like, but, like, like he's, he's, he's not even in that one. He's not even really after anything. He's just trying to survive for the most part. But when he finds out, you know, a, a yeah, and that, no, he like, definitely like, comes around in the end. But and, yeah. and that's part of what bothers me about Temple of Doom being a prequel is it kind of messes up his character arc and growth in yeah. this film yeah, if you yeah. take that one you're like really you saw a guy remove a beating heart from the chest yeah. of a dude who's now still alive even though the heart is outside of his body and now he's being burned alive and the heart's in the hand and like you don't believe in the power of the arc yet you've seen all this other like crazy stuff like i just yeah, yeah. anyways i won't go off on that tangent, <laughs> it does yeah it does it does kind of uh i goof that up a little bit but i mean like for for those who don't know the reason why temple of doom um ends up so when the movie was released it wasn't marketed as a prequel the word prequel didn't exist right. um 
it was it was just another Indiana Jones movie. And well, the George way that it was a prequel because he said he was like, no, I want this. I want this to be I don't want to do a sequel. I want to do a prequel. But yeah, okay. the, the lexicon for the, 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 the average uh, American public was not. The, yeah. the, the story that I've always heard is that is that um, like that when people were like, wait, what about Marion? He's cheating on Marion like what's what happened yeah and then they're like oh well, this is before <laughs> this is before that but if you and look it was at like the a year way of, of saying yeah. yeah when the opening year for so that means that raiders must be 1938 because temple of doom i think takes place in 1936 no so if, i, I like, double checked this it, uh raiders is 36 it's 1936 so I think, okay I so think, temple I think it's two years before that it's 34 34 but, and it uh, has the yeah. year at the very beginning but who really pays attention to that does it have the year at the very beginning it of does the it has the year at the very <laughs> beginning of each okay. film yeah um so yeah i but i mean like like it all it all comes together in the end in, in last crusade right where we get exactly. the explanation of of why indy is the way that he is um which is that you know his mom abandoned him and his dad was she didn't abandon jerk. him she died <laughs> She well, died. No, okay. She kept her but, illness from them. Yes, and then that's, but 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 he does. But he does say like that's why mom left, right? Like she she does leave him with his dad, and then she dies, right? Like oh, like does it, she? It's a, I thought yeah, it was yeah, yeah. mom. Mom never understood, and then he said, "Oh yes, she did. Only too well. Unfortunately, she kept her illness from me, and all I could do was mourn. So." Hmm. But anyway, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I, I th- I we're think here about Indi- Raiders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In, Indy had a different. Indy has a different perspective, right? They kind of, they, and they, you're right. They kind of go back and forth with it a little bit. Um, and he comes out. He, he speaks about it in the way that a that a upset child would speak about it. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, we, we've talked a ton about Indy and Harrison. We haven't talked very much about Marion. Marion and Marian we have Raven. to. We have to yes. because she is. She is such an amazing character. Yes. Um, and and yeah, I mean, like, listen, I I I love Willie <laughs> in Temple of Doom. I think that she's an underrated character. Yeah, for but, sure. But um, because she gets she gets a lot of a lot she gets of, a lot of uh, flack. Uh, yeah, but but um I think it's I think it's mostly because she's being compared to Marion, who I think it is, is one of the yeah. best like by uh, uh, yeah. heroine like yeah. action adventure heroines in, and poor in, kate capshaw um, was so just good. caught off guard yeah. by the by the hate well, that she got for but it's yeah. just it's a completely different character you can't compare the two they are yeah. they are two d- very different women in very different worlds but which Marian, was supposed uh, to be the point right i mean like yeah, that's exactly. kind of the idea um i and and then we come back in 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 last crusade with ilsa where it's like where we we take that even a step further where it's like oh she's a little bit more like marion and we're sort of led down that path only to, to discover that she's actually well, I, well yeah but it's because she's you almost know. she's like a blend of indy and belloc because a belloc bit, even yeah, says yeah. to indy he's like you know you, you're just a shadowy reflection of me so i i, I picture elsa more like belloc but mm. just the femme fatale bond type. Yeah, girl. yeah, yeah. But yes, Marion, um, Marion. She's tenacious. She's bold. She's feisty. She's capable. She's smart. But she's also so soft and warm mm-hmm. and funny and endearing. And she is capable. I already said that, but I'll say it again. She can throw a punch and she can yeah. drink. And she yeah. is allowed to be angry. Mm-hmm. I just love it when when uh, when the main leading lady is just allowed to have the full gambit of emotion and she's just done she's done she's done yeah. with his uh oh, so side note here though that's kind of cuz I didn't realize quite the age disparity uh, and it had the potential to be even grosser than it was. So shout out mm-hmm. to uh, uh, to Spielberg for saying that she'd better be older when Lucas suggested that Marion would have a romantic past with Indy at the age of 11. <laughs> yeah. There's... <laughs> Listen. Like, what? 
WTF, uh, George. Yeah. Like, yeah. Sorry, my man. I know that it's in the 30s, but even like, so Marion is 15 mm-hmm. and Indy is 27 mm-hmm. when they have their secret relationship. So he's 12 yeah, years which, older than her. And that's still a which big is all, Yeah, already. It's already wildly inappropriate. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, yeah. Um, yeah, George, George has some weird stuff around that sort of thing, you know, yep. like Anakin and Padme and, yep. you know, just, yeah, I was like, man, just, what is what I uh, just, George, I really, yeah. I want to, I want to, I want to put you up on that pedestal, but I can't. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is to me, to me, it is the, it is really the one and only thing where I, where I kind of go like, mm, I don't know what's going on there, but mm-hmm. I think. I think part of it comes from just sort of like I not to excuse or or sort of like explain away, but I I think that a lot of it comes from like just sort of like mythic archetypes, um, and like sometimes sometimes I think that George loses the forest for the trees with that stuff, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and sort of like focuses on the archetype at at the expense of like what's a modern sensibility, mm-hmm. um, and so and so I think that like there's a little bit of that that sneaks in there. Um, and I think that I think that he is just not attuned specifically. Romance is not his thing. He puts <laughs> yeah. romance in his stories, yeah. but it like listen like the romance that's in Empire and Return Lawrence of the Jedi is, Lawrence Casden. That's Lawrence Casden. It's <laughs> and that's Lawrence Casden in this right? film too. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, then because then you flip to the prequels and it's like the the prequels are full of romance. All three of those movies. It's are George's full of romance. romance though. But it's George's romance and it's this yeah. weird, like, like, and I, for me, it works because, because Anakin and Padme are, um, they're, 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 it's a tragic love story. So they're, they're destined for failure anyways. So you kind of always want to be like, I don't, you guys, I don't know if you actually do love each other. I think this might just be like, <laughs> I, I think, think this might be the other I think stuff going children. on. Yeah. It's yeah, like, yeah. I think. I think uh, I think actually you're just infatuated with the idea of. I think one you another. have a mother complex, Anakin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. So yeah, she was real nice to you right after you left your mom, and then she was real nice to you right after your mom died, and so yeah. you think that you are in love with her, but really you're just trying to replace your mother figure. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyways. 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 <laughs> that's Tangents. A, that's, yeah. It's a whole other thing, right? Yeah. But, but yeah, like the good romance stuff in Star Wars is all Lawrence Casted. It's all yep. Lawrence Casted, and, and, and with a, with a dash of Irving Kirshner in there because I think that his right. yes. sort of rom com sensibility makes its way into Empire and yeah. uh, and gives us some of the better moments with those characters. But um, yeah, so I the, like that stuff is always just a little bit weird. Yeah. But but again, it also I mean, like you said, it, it it's the 1930s. It is. So it's also. Which and it would have this would have been even like ten In, years almost yeah. prior to that, right? So not not quite ten years, but right, yeah. But it would have been like the early thirties, like like late twenties. So yeah, this, the sensibilities. If we want to like sort of put it in a historical context, why you would write it that way, interesting. Yeah, but uh, I I but yeah. yeah, we can kind of just go eh, whatever. Um, but also also. <laughs> Let's not let's not take away from the fact that Harrison himself, as a real human being, had a little bit of a penchant for uh, for going after younger women. So uh, yeah. you know he's got a little he got a little bit of a re- and, and and he was married at the time. So yes. you know it's yeah, not no. always no, uh, no. you know it, this is just, why we can't put everybody on pedestals uh, all the time. No, I was just surprised. I was like, okay, because growing up, yeah. I I you know she says the line, "I was a child, I was in love. It was wrong, and you knew it." But then yeah. him coming back with saying, you knew what you were doing. Like, I guess growing up, I always thought make, maybe she was like, not that it's even that much of a difference, but like 16, 17 at least. Yeah. Yeah. And to learn that she was 15, I was like, and he was 27. That was the other thing was learning his age in relation to yeah. her age. And I was like, yeah. okay. Yeah. And then just the whole, you know, he's his, the whole the, the, relationship dynamics and all that yeah anyways but yeah no i love like marion amazing and karen allen i just she she really advocated for the character of marion like the Mm. the scene where they're in the tent and 
Belloc is like, oh, I have this pretty dress. And like, I don't know why guys are always just like have this dress lying around, but like, he's like, oh, look at this pretty dress I got for you. And mm-hmm. she was just like, there is no reason for her to put on this dress. And mm-hmm. Stephen was like, oh, well, you guys figure it out then. And it was her and Freeman workshopping that scene. Like, okay, well, why is it that she would even put this dress on in the first place? And it was, okay, well, sh- maybe she sees the knife on the table and she thinks, oh, uh, it's, it's I'll use my, my clothes to disguise that I'm going to be taking this knife. And it's like, when you have a wonderful, a very, and she was very new to the scene too, young actress that's just advocating so much for a character that she truly fell in love with when she first read the script. Um, that's what I think elevates Marion to the status that she's at, just like we have Carrie Fisher with Princess Leia. It's, we have Karen Allen as Marion Ravenwood and she's, it's, it's yeah. so, it's so Star Wars adjacent to me, for yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, totally. No. And that's, that's the place where it's like the, the, what we were talking about before we kind of go like, okay, George, we'll let you have that. Like, well, we're not, we're not cool with it but we're also not going to like roast you for it too much because yeah. he is also then responsible for creating um, what is really like the archetype of, uh, of like that strong female character as, as it yeah. comes to be known. Right. Yeah. Leia, Marion, I would say like the other, the other character from this era of film that fits that bill is Lois Lane, right? Uh, uh, Margot Kidder's uh, Lois Lane with very similar, all three of those characters. So cut from the same cloth, right? Um, I would agree, except yeah. that I've never seen. <laughs> oh, you've never seen 19, like the, 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 the original Superman movie. No. I, uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> I know. So right? Good. So good. <laughs> Another <laughs> perfect 10. I, but is it, I, every time I watch Raiders, I am always kind of like flabbergasted at at the fact that Karen Allen was not a bigger mm-hmm. star. That yeah. that like this movie wasn't like the beginning of an incredible career for her because like she, she's had a good career and she's been around and and done stuff all throughout that that time, right? But like really like from then until now, but um not as much as you would expect based on the, no. the strength of this performance. Right. Yeah. But, but at the same time, Carrie Fisher also does not have a huge, mm-hmm. huge career on mm-hmm. film. Right. Like I, it, it's to me, it's, it's such a weird thing. And I think, I think that honestly, it just comes from the fact that, that as much as these characters were beloved in these films, people weren't ready to accept that type of character in a broader sense. People right? weren't yet writing the scripts that yeah. would attract. Yeah. I mean, we own like, okay. Ridley Scott uh, is like, okay. Alien strong female character. Um, uh, Terminator. Uh, what's her name? Sarah Connor. Right. Oh, Sarah Connor, yeah. Like we don't like, I like was people giving Karen Allen, like beefy meaty nice uh, like scripts or were they just type yeah. like could they have been giving her typecast scripts that she was like nah like what did she yeah. have available to that was from. coming and or, landing on her yeah. deck or like the types of movies that were being made and people had decided because because she became synonymous with Marion, same with Carrie Fisher as Leia, right? Yeah. Like, at what point is it like, well, you're not right for any of these parts yeah. because we're looking for like a Mark Hamill's more classical, Walker, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, it, it, I, I think that there's probably some of that at play as well. But it just the 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 dimensions that this character has on screen, it's just there aren't a lot of other characters at that point in time. It's something that I think we're very used to now, right? Like from Mm -hmm. the nineties forward, it it becomes very common to have like, you know, sort of like the spitfire uh, female lead um, in an action movie. I, but, but at the time it was like, yeah, the fact that she, she maybe she doesn't quite keep up with Indy, but you know she grabs that frying pan and the guy chases her into the into the thing and she knocks him out. And, yeah, you know, and that's like, Karen she, she being like, herself. I wanted to. She's like, I wanted to be actively. I didn't want her to just be sitting there. I wanted her to always mm-hmm. be actively 
trying to contribute in the background. So it yeah. wasn't even things that were necessarily even written for her, even in that script itself. It was yeah. still somewhat of a, a, like, at times, sexist typecast of damsel in distress. And it was really Karen Allen that was like, okay, no, I I want to be trying to, I don't want to just be standing here, like, waiting for Indy to save mm-hmm. me. I want to be active in my rescue. And I think I think that's why it ends up being the case where throughout the the you know sort of the meta narrative of the next two movies, everybody's going like, "But what about Marion? What about mm-hmm. Marion? Where's Marion?" Because I think that as an audience, we see the two of them together. Not to mention the fact that that her and Harrison just have amazing chemistry. Mm-hmm. Um, but we we look at that character and you compare her to Willie or you compare her. To, to Ilsa or you know just really any any sort of of the relationships that, that come in the in the in the subsequent films um and it's like well nobody else is a match for Indy no. except and, for her and for for female viewers she's mm-hmm. so much more relatable she's like mm-hmm. I'm not going to be some fancy dancer singer like Willie yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. not some fancy archaeologist doctor like Elsa like yeah. I'm I might just be the girl that works down the street at the local bar like obviously she owns the bar because she's yeah. the, her dad died and she's stuck there but like the same she's she's uh she's just she's similar to Indy in that she's a more relatable everyday kind of character I say that like relatable every day he's an archaeologist but still like you get what I'm trying to say she's a she's a an easier self-insert for Mm -hmm. the female audience that is watching the film for sure for sure I yeah man I I well we we've we've talked a lot about sort of like the 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 details of Indiana Jones I am I do have to bring it into the personal space though. I want to know, I want to know why Indy is a perfect 10 for you. But beyond that, because I think that like we've made a, we've made a fair case. I don't think anybody's going to argue with us about whether or not Indiana Jones is a perfect 10, Mm. but for you, for you personally, what's the, like, what's the deep connection? Cause, cause for, for the listeners, Cheryl is like a thousand percent committed to Indiana Jones as, as like the fandom, you know, I, I, I mean like we're audio only, but I'll let you guys know, like she, she's wearing the hat right now uh, as we record. So like <laughs> what, why Indiana Jones? And I'm going to, I'm going to say something that some people might find a little bit controversial, but I think that everybody can just go ahead and like take a step back and, and, and realize there's some truth in this. It's not necessarily I I what would be classically considered like a female oriented fandom to be a part of, right? Like right. it is definitely more more yeah. male focused, right? Oh gosh, but, yeah. You look at the indie you, cosplayers, the lineup yeah. is mostly men. That would be yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So yeah. but for you, like as 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 a woman that loves Indiana Jones, like what what's the deal? What's going on there? I wanna know. It's it's funny. I Indiana Jones has always been a part of my lexicon the same way Star Wars has. And mm-hmm. for the listeners that do not know, I my first and favorite, my first love is Han Solo. Hmm. So it's not that big of a stretch that my second love is Indiana yeah. Jones. Um, uh, we... I got a, it. We had it on VHS. I know it was re-released in 88. And by then we probably would have had a VHS machine because, you know, you didn't get that until the mid 80s because they were hella expensive when they first came out. Yeah. So it was just always, I don't have like a first memory of watching it mm-hmm. for the first mm-hmm. time. My parents let me watch these films when I was much, much too young. I shouldn't <laughs> have been watching them. I have, yeah. you know, the the end scene with, with Totes, face melting and Dietrich's face imploding on itself and uh and Belloc exploding and all you know like it was this was the movie that was responsible for the PG-13 rating that did not exist before this film this is this is where that came in and I was watching this film way before I was 13 years old um Mm. but that being said I don't remember the first time I watched it it's just always been a part of my memory and we were (sighs) My dad and I and my sister 
are the type of people that when we like a film, we will watch it repeatedly. My mom, not so much. We kind of drove her nuts. So growing up, it for me, it was Indiana Jones trilogy, Star Wars trilogy, and Back to the Future trilogy. Those are my mm. bread and butter. Um, Star Wars was my first love, Indy, my second. And so I've just, it's just always been a part of my life. I've probably seen Raiders of the Lost Ark well over a thousand times, because if you times by the year that I probably started watching it and the fact that easily my family would probably watch it maybe once a month. But when I was a teenager, I was probably watching this film once a week and like Mm. for multiple months at a time, like I had the cardboard cut out, which I sadly don't have anymore from the, when the, when the VHS is, or no, it came out on DVD release. I went down to the local HMV store and was like snagged that cardboard um, display piece, somehow nabbed that. And then I don't, I don't have it anymore, sadly, but like, yeah, it's just always been a part of my childhood. And even though it totally uh, some scenes scarred me. <laughs> uh, it's just, uh, yeah. And I just, I always gravitate. I don't know why, because you would think like, I know so many girls are like, Oh, like I just gravitated towards princess Leia or I just gravitated towards Mary and Raymond. I was just like, I, I guess because, you know, I wanted to marry Han Solo. I wanted to marry Indiana Jones. That's just, I just naturally, I just grad I just like gravitated towards Harrison's characters. And I don't know yeah. why. I but that's just how I am. I just if I'm gonna cosplay, I'm gonna cosplay as Indy and I'm gonna cosplay as Han. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's 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 one of those ones. It's I mean it's very similar to to what I said about Ghostbusters when we in, in the first episode of the podcast. Um, where it's like I just I don't even remember not having seen ghostbusters and and similarly it's like yeah i saw it at way too young an age um and traumatized me and all of that stuff but i wouldn't trade it for anything <laughs> yeah right? it's like it but it also made me who i am right so i i totally get that that like like i i the funny thing for me is that like i indian star wars are actually things that i came to later uh i think i was about nine the first time that i watched the Indiana Jones movies. And I remember, um, I mean, like I had some familiarity with them because they would be on TV from time to time. And, you know, you'd see bits and pieces here, but not very often like star Wars and Indy were those types of movies that like, just like, they weren't really, they didn't really get played on TV a lot. I remember, I remember when last crusade had like the, the big TV premiere, like this is the first time we're ever showing this on TV. Right. Um, which was actually like a long time after the movie had come out. Like it had been out a couple of years Mm -hmm. and then, and then it got like a, like a television premiere. Um, but I, I like sort of in the mid nineties. Right. I, but, but I remember, I remember, I, I, I I don't remember what I was sick with. I I think it was like, was it the chicken? No, it wasn't the chicken pox. That was when I was younger, but I remember that I was like homesick and it was going to be a few days that I was going to be homesick. And my dad was like, like, I'm going to go to the video store. What do you want? Um, and I was like, oh, I, I want to watch Indiana Jones. Um, and uh, and and he was like, OK, well, there are three Indiana Jones movies. Which one do you want? <laughs> and I was like, I want the one I want the one with the boulder in it, like where right. he like runs from the boulder, I like in the temple. And and my dad goes, that's probably in Temple of Doom. <laughs> right? Oh no! And, and so he so he goes and he rents me Temple of Doom, and I watch all the way through Temple of Doom. And we get to the end of the movie, I'm like there was no boulder in that movie. <laughs> um, that scene that scene's not in that movie. I and I mean like I look you know I I'm not gonna look the gift horse in the mouth on that one temple of doom is an awesome movie too mm-hmm. um it's like it's like saying you know it's like oh, i'm going to mcdonald's do you want a hamburger or chicken nuggets and you're like i don't know just give me something with barbecue sauce and i'll be happy and uh you know it doesn't matter what comes back it's that both are both are delicious so i yeah like i but there was like a learning curve there 
um, my dad, my dad was a, was a, a huge nerd. Uh, and that's where, that's where I got it from came by, you know, quite naturally uh, as his son. But I, uh, I, but he wasn't very detail oriented. It's a fun, it's a funny thing whenever I look back at it um uh, on those moments as a kid where it's like one of star wars or andy or any of that stuff that i would become obsessed with he was like yeah i like it it's yeah that's cool like yeah we can go to that movie or rent that or whatever um and he would have some knowledge but but yeah i just always that that will always stick with me that i was like yeah i want it's why i don't know why you didn't just rent me all three indiana jones movies, right you know? well because it wasn't three. cheap right like yeah yeah yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I, so yeah, it, it would be, a, it wouldn't be until a couple of years later that I think that I would have like actually sat down and watched all of them. I think probably when, when the VHS box set came out, which was like after the special edition. So yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 It would, it would have been like, uh, like that mid, re-release mid right? to late nineties. Yeah, I think it was I think it was around like 97, 98. Yeah. That that would have happened. Yeah. Um and so it wasn't it wasn't until I owned them that that I w- was able to like really really get to know Andy. So like, yeah, like we're now talking I can about like, fixate. <laughs> yeah, like like I was like I was like 12 or 13, right? Like so I mean like also perfect age because I'm at the I'm at the right age to not just like enjoy them but also to like understand them mm-hmm. you know because i think mm-hmm. when you're younger than that i think if you're like 10 or younger that it's that it's oh like yeah you can, you can, it's fun but there's a lot yeah. that's going over your head in terms of what's happening in the story yeah. so it, it's one of those things but but like it's when i talk about star wars i didn't come to star wars until i was 10 right like before that i was a star trek fan right uh, specifically next gen so um uh, and and much more obsessed with ghostbusters and ninja turtles and then and then eventually like spider-man and x-men so it wasn't until i was like 10 years old that i even got into star wars so coming to to indie um even later than that it's like yeah it kind of makes sense right that i would i would you know obsess and fixate on star wars and then eventually that would lead you to indiana jones mm-hmm. but, uh, That's but it was also adjacent. just an, yeah it was also <laughs> just an accessibility thing i think like like gen gen z uh and younger like they they really don't understand yes. the scarcity of these things in the early yeah. 90s where it was like well i want to watch indiana jones or go to the video store and if they even have copies of the first three movies right like of, of the of the of the indiana jones trilogy are they available right now? Has somebody else rented them? Because they've probably only got one copy of each, right? right. So you go yeah. to the video store looking for something to rent, and it's like, oh yeah, we don't. It's it, you know, it's out. We can hold it when it comes back or whatever, right? Like, like I to I think to a Gen Z kid, it's like you couldn't just you couldn't just go buy it or you couldn't just stream it online. It wasn't just accessible. Mm-hmm. It's like no, it wasn't because also movies weren't just in print all the time vhs tapes used to be very expensive at a certain point like they like a a single vhs tape was like 150 bucks in some instances right yeah in the very early 80s yeah 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 so um you know like it it was yeah owning a video at home was like such a crazy prospect i remember when when jurassic park came out on vhs that was like the first movie that i ever pre-ordered Right. Like the first the first thing that actually that would have been the first thing that I ever pre-ordered is that like Rogers video, which was a chain up here in Canada. I I don't have to explain to you, but Mm -hmm. I have to explain to the audience. Mm -hmm. I so go to Rogers video and they they had posters for Jurassic Park coming to home video. And I remember it was like it was a massive deal because it's not like it was 20 bucks. I think it was like around $60 in 1993. Okay, that's like a movie costing a hundred bucks now, right? Like it was, it was crazy how much that VHS cost. But the 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 argument to my dad was like, I'm gonna watch this like a thousand times. Like I don't mm-hmm. need to rent movies for the next month. I'm just gonna watch Jurassic Park over and over. And that is exactly what I did. But yeah, I can remember like like pre ordering that, and the next thing I would have pre ordered was the Star Wars trilogy, the T- THX 
Star Wars trilogy when that came out. But um, like, I like, read like you had of... you had to get this stuff because it if it like once it was gone, it was gone. It was well, they, they weren't gonna you, make more. You, like a lot of our films. I can still probably tell you where the commercial cuts are on the Goonies because <laughs> I remember when we got our VHS machine, yep. that was a big deal. But we yep. got one of the ones where it was like, okay, now you look at the TV guide schedule and you figure yep. out when the movies are going to play on TV and you have that blank VHS tape ready to go. And then you record your movies off the TV. And that yep. was a lot of the versions of the films that we watched was the TV ones because yep. to buy the VHS was very expensive and wasn't always readily available. Right. And so, yeah, yeah. it's no, so I funny. I totally understand this. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't remember what movie it was that we had taped, but I, um, there was a movie that was on and we, we taped it and I, I, but I, I vividly remembered the promo <laughs> for scrooged like the bill murray film like the the mm -hmm. the, the christmas carol his cr version of the of the christmas carol uh scrooged on check six which was the the uh, i i think that was out of victoria right um, yeah no yeah yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah i i can see every frame of that promo and i think it was it was a it was one of those types of movies it was like an indiana jones or like a, or like star wars or something i can't remember what movie it was but i remember because it was a movie that we watched over and over and over again and i remember these like every commercial break there was a promo for next saturday night's movie which was going to be scrooged so clearly this was you know at christmas um <laughs> it might have been home i think it might have been home alone i think we might have taped home alone but uh oh, another anyways 10. yeah oh absolutely <laughs> i i so yeah yeah it's just like 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 such a different time mm -hmm. but then eventually then eventually when i did get get it on vhs i mean like i just obsessed over yeah them. and i still i there there's not a lot of VHS tapes that I still have. Uh, I've gotten rid of most of my collection, but I do still have my, I, uh, all of my star Wars movies on VHS, um, multiple copies of some of them. Um, not just different versions, but like I have multiple copies of the, of the, uh, the THX original trilogy. Um, nice. but Indiana Jones is one of those. It's because it, it's like, well, what am I going to, I can't get rid of this. Is it's it the box? Item. Is it the box set that has the nice art on the outside? It it is the box set. Yeah, yeah, hundred nice. percent. Yeah, yeah. And then the DVD set I still have, and then the Blu-ray set I have. <laughs> like it's, uh, yeah. And uh, I don't have them in 4K. Uh, or no, are mine? No, I think they're just Blu-ray. I don't think they're 4K. Maybe no, I they think are they're the 4K just. Ones. I think they're re-releasing a, a steel copy I, 4K. Yeah, the 4K ones would be really recent, right? Yeah. Um, in any case, yeah, like like I, uh, uh, that's one of those things. It's like, oh, if there's a box set of 4K, I guess I'll get those. But they'll probably put one out with five in it soon, so I'll wait. I'll wait. Right. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, I oh man, I just looked at the time. It, we've gone for almost an hour and a half. No, uh, I know. I was like, we didn't even cover all the points that I wanted to cover, but I, mean, I, was I just like, need I to was, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always love it when I look at the time. I'm like, did we do it? Did we do it? Is that a podcast episode? And I'm usually looking to make sure that we made it more than an hour. Uh, and we did. We absolutely did effortlessly. Um, mm -hmm. Indy 5 is coming out. Dial of Destiny. I, how are you feeling about it? The reviews, as of right now, are not hugely favorable. But, uh, but those are Kingdom all, of the like, Crystal what, Skull critics? was also yeah exactly yeah I I how how are you feeling are you are you are you are you feeling good about it I'm excited I've got my tickets and everything uh, I would have my tickets except that I live in a smaller town and they uh, have not popped up for me to purchase yet for my local theater here but mm -hmm. uh, once they do I will be going opening day and I will be wearing my full indie cosplay to the theater like the huge nerd that I am um, I'm super excited. Uh, I know to try to manage my expectations a yeah. little bit. Uh, this is a totally new director. Um, I also am just preparing to cry a lot. Like <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's hard to see uh, Harrison aging 
just because yeah. it's like it just reminds me like he's not always going to be here and uh just knowing that this is his final chapter as Indy um I'm sure I will be uh ugly crying a bunch mm. throughout the film um but uh but I'm excited so but yeah we'll see we'll see how it goes yeah yeah i'm yeah i'm i'm i think i'm in the same boat where i'm like sort of cautiously optimistic about it i think that i'll probably enjoy it more than the more than the critics have been um because like i like i said before yeah like uh, kingdom of the crystal skull gets a bad rap i think it's uh, i think it's pretty good it drags a little bit in the third act but um but that's a lot of movies of this era uh, where they're where they're about 15 to 20 minutes too long so um yeah i i don't know i'm 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 excited to see it i i i i, I think it i think it's gonna be fine i think it's gonna be good i think it's gonna be a good movie i don't but, think uh, i also like you know we gotta have faith that harrison harrison's pretty protective of this character mm-hmm. and i know that he only comes back when he thinks it's a good story so yeah yeah um yeah i'm just wondering how much like i i defending and justifying of it i'm gonna have to do like i did with kingdom of the crystal skull where there is a lot of like me walking out of that movie going like that what it's really interesting to see the take on indy as it as we enter like the 1950s right like because that right it It goes for a different style and i don't think people understood that it was going for those 1950s b movies and that that yeah and that's why there's like it's 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 the Russians because mm-hmm. it like that's the that's the predominant threat at that point in time. It's the double crosses because everybody's a spy, everybody's a double agent, right? Yeah. Double, triple, quadruple agent. Um, and then and then that the scene with the ants, and it's like I love that because I look at that and go, there's like there's symbolism here that the that the Russian uh, these these evil Russians get uh, devoured by these red ants, these giant red ants, um, because ants are communist, right? And they're red. It's like like there's there's all this like symbolism there that very, like I think I think is really symbolism. yeah well, super overt, but for some yeah. reason is like totally lost on the majority of the audience. And then on top of that, it's a, it's an homage to, uh, as you said, like the B movie stuff, the, the yeah. flying saucer at the end, yeah. the ants yeah. are a direct reference to the movie them. Right. Like it, like it, 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 it's like, there's, there's so much going on there. I'm really curious to see if, um, well, if Dial 19... of Destiny is going to do a 1960s, the trailer yeah. has, you know, like the, the, the mashup music to it that I'm like, okay, so like, we're like, we're, we're bringing in the Rolling Stones and mashing it up with the indie theme. Is this indicative of like a thematic element in the way that we're telling this story that like, this is indie, like he's in the 1960s. Well, or... it's going to be like, uh, it's Operation Paperclip, right? So, yeah, I so, yeah, I I'm worried. I'm worried that it's going to be a little bit too much. The Force Awakens, where it tries to just go back and recapture the magic of of Raiders, and it's like, but don't like that's the thing is that like don't. Well, you can't because because you can't right. <laughs> and and I like that's sort of the note to end on with this with this podcast is, um, there are five Indiana Jones films and there's a television series and there are comic books and novels and video games. There's, there are all of these other Indiana Jones stories. And to me, like I, I love almost all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, and like there, there are varying degrees of quality throughout that. I, the, the video games are not as great as the movies. The, the comic books are a little bit, uh, hit and miss but have some fun stuff in them right and then and even with the movies themselves the four that we have access to currently uh are are of like sort of different different tiers of quality it's not quite the same as star wars um but they're all great mm-hmm. at the same time like nothing compares to raiders of the lost ark and i yeah. don't just mean other indiana jones stories 
I just mean movies, right? Like, like there are a handful of films that are just like, they, they transcend any conversation about quality or, uh, you know, like, like, like comparison, like, like, why would you compare any movie to Raiders of the Lost Ark? There's mm-hmm. no point. Right. No. Like, like the mummy movies. I, I love the first two mummy movies. I haven't seen the third one, but um, like the mummy is, is phenomenal. What a great movie. And it's Super such fun. a like send up of, of Indiana Jones and like, mm-hmm. like a lot of references and, and callbacks to the Indiana Jones franchise in those movies. Um, would I ever compare the mummy to Raiders of the Lost Ark? Why bother? Why mm. bother? It's like, somebody walking off the street and saying that they're going to fight Mike Tyson. And it's like, you know what? Don't bother. Like, like he's going to, he's going to eat you alive potentially yeah. f- for real. Right. Uh, you know, Locked in Arc is just, it's, it's one of those films that was just, it happened at the right moment in time with the mm-hmm. right people. And I don't think like, it just, it's one of those films that that happens yeah. so rarely. And it is, yeah it, there's yeah th- uh, yeah i just i think i, I could go I on, think I, and on but i won't <laughs> i have to i think to close out this episode i have to coin a phrase and and crown raiders of the lost ark like this movie is the most perfect 10 like mm-hmm. it just like this is as much as everything else that we've talked about on the podcast uh so far everything's a perfect 10 it's all the stuff that we talked about Ghostbusters, Transformers, the movie, the soundtrack, A Knight's Tale, you know, like I, I, we've talked about so many great things on the podcast. I just like Raiders of the Lost Ark is why movies exist. It mm-hmm. just it like, like full stop. Anybody who disagrees with that, I just don't think that they understand the medium to the degree that somebody like Steven Spielberg understands what film is and what can be done and Mm -hmm. why we make movies right um it just yeah it is it is the most perfect 10 i and i i don't i don't i don't know that i'll get a lot of flack for that one i don't think this is a controversial uh, yeah no i don't think it's a hot take i think it's a pretty universal one (laughs) yeah um awesome well we did it we did it that's an episode of perfect 10 I uh, thank you so much, Cheryl, for talking to Indiana Jones with me. This uh, I, was an absolute pleasure. Awesome. I we we will have you back, possibly to talk about other Indiana Jones movies. But uh, you know, there's other stuff. There's other stuff that we can talk about. Yeah, I'm um, always happy to talk indie. Yeah, the best thing is that like everybody is always like, well, when are you going to do Star Wars? Well, I'll, never. I, <laughs> <laughs> You've it's got how many easy. other podcasts probably yeah. for that one? Yeah. I have talked about Star Wars enough. And the thing is, is that every episode of Perfect 10 always comes back to Star Wars. Yeah. So I, I, but yeah, I, so we'll, but we'll find something else. We'll find something else meaty and juicy to dig into at some point in the future. Cause it was a great joy having you on the podcast for this episode. I thank you everybody for listening uh, and, uh, and, and, and loving uh, indiana jones as much as we do i uh, i or you know coming close i don't know i don't know i don't even know if i love indy as much as cheryl i i feel like i'm close but but i don't have a hat i don't i don't have a i don't have the outfit um <laughs> i wish i did but i don't um so yeah like you you got me there i i I don't know what the next episode is i know what the episode after that is i know that in august we're going to do uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the 1990s TMNT, which will be fun because that's also, I, I, I think that's our one year anniversary of the podcast. Um, so I know what that one is. I don't know what July is. I don't have a guest. I don't have a topic for it yet. So I, I don't know, like tune in in four weeks. It, it'll be probably as much of a surprise to you as it is to me. Um, I'm talking to a few people, but, but we'll see, we'll see in terms of scheduling what happens. Um, but yeah, I, I thank you everybody for listening. Thank you, Cheryl, for joining me and, uh, 
and uh, is there anything that you don't have anything to plug? You have no shows or if people want to like follow you on the internet, can they? Oh yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Cheryl K bell is my handle on Twitter. So as yeah. long as Twitter is still around and as long and, as Twitter uh, is still around, I'm pretty sure yeah. I have a similar handle on Instagram. <laughs> I don't know. Like, <laughs> cool um well yeah i i yeah go 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 follow cheryl she you you post some good insightful stuff every now and then you're not quite as active as as some of us i i you know terminally online individuals uh, but i but you're oh wow i I see i i see myself as a terminally online individual so I uh, maybe you're just maybe you're just not as uh, uh, entitled when it comes to your viewpoints on things <laughs> as as you know an individual like myself is right uh, right where I right. think like I, I just saw Spider Verse yeah it's it's super important <laughs> that I let everybody know exactly how right. I feel about this I got gotcha. you okay um, yeah yeah that's a that's a it's it's that's a it's a different it's a different kind of terminally online uh, mm. the attention seeking kind. Um, <laughs> Anyways, uh, this is this is not a therapy session. I don't need to get into it. I uh, <laughs> thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Cheryl, for joining me, and uh, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Thunderquack Perfect Ten is hosted by me, Michael Cohen. Follow us on Twitter at Thunderquack Pod, on Instagram at Thunderquack Podcast, on Facebook at Thunderquack, and join us on Discord at Thunderquack.com/discord. Support the podcast by heading to patreon.com slash thunderquack to get early access, bonus episodes, and the Thunderquack Perfect 10 pop quiz. Thunderquack Perfect 10 is part of the Thunderquack Podcast Network. Thanks for listening.